All righty. So uh, I have shared a link, a uh, notebook. So there are actually I should probably share a link to uh, to this lecture. I'll put it in the chat. Not this one. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, there are two notebooks here. Uh, one is called VI and CY from scratch, and another one called RY from scratch. We will start with the VI and CY from scratch, right? So uh, if you click on it, it will uh, open a notebook uh, on GitHub, and then there will be an opening collab badge, and you click on it, and then it will open it in a new tab where you have an interactive uh, uh, Jupyter notebook, essentially. Okay, so um, assuming that you are already familiar with the basics of uh, variational autoencoders and how uh, uh, to use them using off the shelf packages, uh, including Atom AI and Pyroved, uh, today's uh, lecture is about uh, how um, sort of nuts and bolts uh, of the variational autoencoders. And uh, the, the the idea is that when you apply uh, VIs to uh, scientific research, in many cases you need um, to modify either your architectures or your loss functions uh, so that they so that these models, the VI model, better represents uh, your uh, the physical processes uh, that you're interested in, right? And it is usually quite difficult to do it with off-the-shelf tools. And so you really need to know how it works under the hood so you can customize it uh, uh, to your needs, right? So that's the idea. Again, the assumption is that you're already familiar with the VI because uh, there were lectures that introduced them. So we are not going, and notice there are no PowerPoint slides. So it's all about uh, our coding here. Uh, but yeah, so the idea is how we go from off the shelf uh, implementations to uh, uh, customized uh, implementations where you can write your own VI from scratch and then modify, easily modify uh, different parts of it. Uh, okay, so, but just very briefly uh, to recap, VI uh, operate uh, by encoding, well, first of all, VI are, the, are a powerful generate model uh, known for the ability to learn rich lat latent representation of data. And uh, the way they work is that they encode input data into a latent space and then decode it back from that latent space to the original space. And the beauty of this model uh, lies in its probabilistic nature because instead of encoding to a fixed point in the latent space, AVI encodes to a distribution, which introduces a regularizing, regularizing uh, effect and ensures that similar inputs have similar encodings and uh, provide the model with its generative uh, capabilities. So the difference between a regular autoencoder and a variational autoencoder is that instead of encoding to a fixed point in a lateral space, we encode to a distribution. And the training process involves two primary components, a reconstruction loss that ensures that decoded outputs closely match the original inputs, and the so-called KL divergence term, that regularizes the learned distribution to be close to some chosen prior, which is usually chosen to be a standard normal distribution. And during the training, we balance those two components uh, to learn meaningful latent uh, space representation while also maintaining its uh, generative uh, cap uh, capacity. Right, and we will talk about it. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the goal of this notebook is to dive really into the implementation details and break down each component and function and show how we can cons construct regular VI, conditional VI, and then notation invariant VI from scratch, and then how we can play with the uh, loss functions. Okay, so let's let's start, right? Uh, let's, in fact, uh, let me um, um, minimize this window. Okay. Um, so yeah, as usual, I'm sure we're all familiar with Collab Notebooks. We uh, we connect uh, to a Google Cloud. Um, it'll take a few seconds. And um, so uh, again, as you know, you can um, select different, uh, uh, you can select different type of um, runtime, uh, right, CPU, A100, V100, T4, uh, TPU, so T4 is sort of a budget uh, GPU version. It's sufficient for uh, today's tutorial. 
uh, but you should be connected to a GPU because uh, it will just take forever to run uh, this notebook on the CPU. Okay, so um, this is just standard import. We don't need to install any library because uh, PyTorch is already in installed on Colab and we are not going to use any of the shelf uh, packages today that already provide uh, uh, PVI. Uh, so instead we're going to implement it from scratch. Now we're going to use MNIST data because um, um, so this is just a, a data set of uh, uh, handwritten digits, uh, which again, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with. Uh, the uh, the reason why we chose it is just because, well, we are limited, uh, we are constrained by time, obviously, and these are sufficiently, sufficiently small images. Uh, but the, the other reason is that in, um, in, in my experience, whenever you want to tweak things, uh, change things, customize things, it's always a good idea to test it on something that has a very well-known ground truth before applying it to some scientific data, because otherwise there is a risk you will discover something in your data that is not actually there, it's just a model artifact. So always you know, test and validate it on the data with a very well-known ground truth, which obviously uh, NIST uh, data set is, right? Um, so the the first thing to do when you construct your VI model is to define the encoder and the decoder uh, models, right? So the encoder is responsible for compressing the input data into latent representations. Uh, so it takes the uh, high dimensional input data such as uh, stack of images, passes it through multiple layers uh, and multiple hidden layers. And this could be just you know, regular linear uh, layers followed by nonlinear activation, or it could be convolutional layers. For uh, today's talk, we'll just you know, consider linear layers, right? So you pass them uh, through uh, these hidden layers, and then in the end, it will map your uh, input passed through these uh, hidden layers to a mean and standard deviation of a, a Gaussian distribution, right? Uh, so for numerical, uh, for the numerical stability purposes, for the purposes of numerical stability, instead of mapping it to a standard deviation, we map it to the log uh, uh, standard deviation, okay? Uh, but that's uh, basically the, um, uh, what, what's happening here, right? X is our input, we pass it uh, through hidden layers, uh, and then uh, we map uh, that um, output to the mean and log uh, standard deviation. Okay, so, and then we construct uh, a decoder and uh, the decoder starts by uh, taking the latent representation and there is some additional step uh, involved here that we'll discuss later. You, It's not this, so we, we, we take the mean and, and standard deviation, the encoded the mean and standard deviation and we, Use it to use them to sample uh, from a Gaussian distribution, and that that sampled vector uh, will be passed to a decoder. I'll show it later. Uh, but basically, yeah, decoder takes that uh, Latin representation and again passes it. Uh, pretty much, you can like people are, like to make it symmetric, uh, right? So uh, it passes through the same model, but in the sort of the the layers are arranged into a reverse uh, order, right? And then. Uh, reconstructs the original um, input essentially, right? Um, and we pass it, uh, if we use something like cross, en uh, uh, cross entropy laws, uh, binary cross entropy laws, which is common to use for images, uh, then it is a good idea to ensure that our outputs are between zero and one. And that's why we pass it through a sigmoid uh, activation function. So what, one thing I should add is that, um, one thing I should add is that um, this, this is something you can really ask chat GPT to do. So um, uh, just be careful. Yeah, like you can you know, ask chat GPT, write me standard encoder and decoder for the VIE and just make sure that, um, um, you know, all layers are uh, hidden, lay or sorry, linear layers, or, but you can also ask it to run some a uh, convolutional analog of this. Um, uh, it's it, it, it's you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing uh, to be very careful is that, so the, the VI we're talking today, 
but assumes that it uh, your encoder outputs log standard deviation. If you, you know, and uh, chat GPT can uh, uh, sometimes output log variance or maybe just variance or just standard deviation. So just make sure that uh, uh, the the assumption is that you are uh, producing log uh, standard deviation. We'll talk about it uh, later. Um, okay, anyways, but yeah, so this is very trivial step and these days you can uh, ask ChatGPT to do it. So, uh, okay, and now we're going to construct a basic VI class uh, that uh, will stitch together the core functionalities of a variational autoencoder. Uh, so we sub all, uh, and as I'm sure you're well aware, all PyTorch models uh, are subclassed from this NN model. That's just standard practice. Uh, so let's, uh, let's break it down, okay? So this is our uh, main VI class. So we start with the uh, initialization, obviously. Uh, here we need, so they, they there are many different ways to do it. You can uh, encoder and decoder initialize in, inside the VI uh, initialization. I find it much more convenient if uh, you initialize uh, your encoder and your decoder separately, and then you pass those initialized encoder and decoder models to the main VI class, right? It also makes the main VI class much cleaner, right? Generally, the more modular approach you take, the better it is from the best uh, software practicing uh, standards, software writing standards, uh, right? Uh, so we also uh, have this uh, um, device, uh, thing which is basically, you know, if uh, if a GPU is available, it will automatically pass everything to GPU, and if not, then it will just run on CPU. But that's that's pretty much it. Okay, and uh, then um, to define the two main components, uh, two main loss function uh, components here, one is KL divergence term, and the other one is uh, likelihood term, right? So we need to write down how they are computed because these are the two most important, well, after the after defining encoder and decoder, you know, the two most important things are these two loss terms. And again, I assume you're already familiar with the VI basics uh, because they were introduced earlier, but here I show how they uh, those things are actually computed. And so uh, what this method uh, does is that uh, it computes a KL divergence term between the either two normal distributions or between a normal distribution and a standard normal distribution. So standard normal distribution, it means it has a mean of zero and variance of one. And um, so in, in my experience, uh, it's usually more than enough just to use standard normal distribution. Sometimes as your prior, uh, sometimes maybe you could, uh, if you have some very good idea about where your latent variable uh, is centered and you're so certain about it, then you want to specify uh, maybe some, you know, very narrow uh, uh, standard deviation around the center. You know, you can, you can just define a, a separate uh, normal distribution prior, but in most cases, uh, you don't really need uh, this, just uh, operate on the standard normal distribution. And then this is another function that computes uh, likelihood which is effectively a negative reconstruction loss. And if we just use a built-in PyTorch uh, binary cross-entropy um, function here. Okay, um, okay. And uh, this is the uh, standard uh, reparameterization trick in, um, in VI, right? And by the way, here, you know, if uh, um, for some reason I skip something during my explanation, I put it all in markdown. So here is a det detailed explanation of what each method does initialization, KL divergence, likelihood, uh, reparameterization trick, uh, uh, computation of probability distribution, and uh, forward pass. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, so, so yeah. So this, um, this is sort of nuts and bolts. And the, the thing is, like, notice that these are class methods. So this method I really inherited to this class, uh, and you don't, to be honest, you don't really need to modify them. That's also one of the reasons. Uh, it's there is an underscore. Here uh, is because uh, these are the methods that one doesn't really expect to, um, you know, to be adjusting a lot. 
Uh, so the reparameterization trick just will always be here. You know, this is just a very standard implementation. You always compute log uh, uh, log normal uh, log PDF of a normal distribution and unit normal distribution the same way, right? Uh, so you can you define it once and then you probably just don't touch them, okay? But the the important uh, part here is the forward pass, which basically describes how your input data propagates uh, through your VI model, right? So we start by uh, encoding data uh, using the encoder uh, that we defined. Uh, earlier, and so, so it maps your input data into uh, mean and uh, log standard deviation of a normal distribution. And then uh, the reparameterized uh, step is essentially sampling from that uh, normal distribution, okay? And so you obtain this uh, ZVEC, which is just, because it's common to call it latent vector, so ZVEC uh, uh, is how we denote it. And then you compute the KL divergence term, which is uh, basically the, uh, uh, the, the distance uh, in statistical sense uh, between your uh, encoded distribution and your prior uh, unit normal distribution, right? So, um, so basically how close your encoded uh, Latin representation is to your prior. And once you do that, uh, you uh, pass your sampled latent vector to the decoder, which takes it and tries to reconstruct the original input, right? So this X reconst is the uh, reconstructed input, and then you compute the uh, likelihood uh, that this, um, well, basically it's a negative reconstruction loss, right? Let's just call it, let's not uh, complicate things, let's just call it, uh, reconstruction loss. So you can uh, you compute it and um, that and you and you record it and you store it um, uh, with uh, within this uh, self KL divergence and self likelihood so that you can access it uh, uh, during the uh, training. Okay, and you know it's common uh, to return the uh, the reconstruction here. Although you know in principle you can uh, also return this uh, encoded latent vector here, but doesn't really matter um, uh, that much, right? So let's not uh, let's not modify it. So that's how you define your uh, VI model, and we'll get to training part uh, shortly. But I'm I'm wondering because I keep talking, and uh, you know, I'm wondering if uh, there are any questions. If you want me to sort of uh, focus on something specific uh, or explain something in more details, then just. Uh, just let me know, put it in the chat or raise your hand uh, if the way works. I'll give you like maybe 30 seconds. <laughs> Need some energy drink. Okay, assuming there are no questions, uh, let's proceed um, to uh, to initializing and then training this uh, VI that we have just uh, defined. So again, as I've just described, VI uh, is now ready to be trained using a combination of reconstruction loads and KL divergence. Uh, and the goal is to optimize its ability to generate new samples while also maintaining meaningful latent representation of the input data. So let's initialize our VI. So remember when we defined our encoder, uh, they required uh, arguments uh, for initializing it. Uh, uh, you need to provide input dimensions. You need to provide uh, the uh, basically the number of neurons in each layer of your uh, simple neural network, uh, which we call, which basically you pass them as a list. Uh, so five, 12, the list uh, contains like three integers here, but it can be more. So the length of this list determines the depth, how deep your neural net is, and the number or this, this, this specific number uh, determines how wide each layer is. So we start with the first, so the layer with 512 neurons accepts our input data. And then uh, you know, we, we pass it through this layer, applying nonlinear activation, 
uh, and then it goes to the smaller layer, uh, layer with smaller number of neurons, and uh, then even uh, less neurons, right? Then we sort of create this bottleneck uh, representation. Uh, and uh, two here uh, stands for the number of latent dimensions. Uh, one of the reasons people use two all the time is just because it makes it easy to visualize it, right? Because it's very high, because then your Latin representation is two dimensional, you can visualize it as just an image. Uh, whether if it's you know three or more dimensions, then it becomes really challenging visualizing it. Uh, and it also works for um, for most data sets. Uh, right, and the decoder is defined sort of in the same, uh, it's actually the exact, well, in, in, in a similar manner is that its input dimensions are the Latin dimensions, which is two, right? So encoder, our encoder encodes input data into the Latin two dimensional Latin representation, and then we sample from it, and then uh, the uh, decoder accepts the two dimensional uh, sampled latent vector, and then sort of passes it uh, through a, a kind of same architecture as an encoder, but in the reversed order. Doesn't really have to be, but it tends to help. Right, uh, so it goes through a layer with 128 neurons, then uh, through a, a wider layer with 256 neurons, and uh, then uh, finally the uh, the output, the final output layer has the same number of neurons as the encoder's input layer, right? So you can easily see that we created a bottleneck here. Uh, so, so we have uh, this contracting path, and then we have expanding path, and then just need to make sure it is aware of the dimensionality of the uh, of the image data, and by the way, notice uh, 784 is 28 times 28. So the image width and height are uh, 28 by 28. And because we use the linear layers and not convolution layers, we have to flatten it into this uh, feature vector, which has 784 uh, dimensions. Okay, um, yeah. And so now that we have initialized an encoder and a decoder, we pass these initialized uh, neural nets to uh, our VIE class. And now we have a VIE model. And um, now uh, we also define a standard um, optimizer, which is, you know, what the most standard optimizer used these days is Adam optimizer. And its role uh, is to adjust uh, the parameters of the VIE during training. Okay, uh, so let's do it. Okay, and okay, so the next step is that we have our training data, but how exactly are we going to pass it uh, to uh, to our VIE model during training? And to do that, we use the uh, the data loader object, uh, which uh, you know can be easily uh, obtained through PyTorch uh, utility functions. So I I, I wrote this um, very simple. Um, uh, help functions that uh, initializes uh, PyTorch data loader uh, objects. So you basically pass your uh, your data as a uh, uh, well, in this case, as a, as a torch tensor, right? And uh, then it creates a data loader object, right? And so that that's pretty much it. You can specify different batch sizes. A hundred is a pretty good uh, batch size for variation ultra encoder, assuming you have uh, enough data, right? And so we just initialize this object called train loader, which will just help us passing uh, data to our VIE model during training. Okay, so we are ready to train our model, uh, but we need to write down a, a, a function that will do that uh, training. And this is uh, where uh, we are going to discuss loss uh, co computation in more detail. So as, as we have already uh, talked about uh, the loss function of VI is a sum of negative log likelihood and the KL divergence term, right? So this is your negative log likelihood and uh, this is the KL uh, divergence term. And you, um, so again, this goes, this comes from the textbook uh, VI uh, theory. Uh, so one, one thing I would like to draw your attention to is this hyperparameter beta. Uh, and uh, it is used to control the trade-off between these two training objectives, as is obvious <laughs> uh, from here. And uh, when beta is equal to one, it's just a standard VI where both objectives are equally weighted. If beta is more than one, 
then obviously KL divergence term becomes more dominant, uh, which uh, might lead to a more regularized latent space. But it could also uh, cause our model to prioritize the latent distribution over accurate reconstruction, right? So it may degrade the quality of the reconstructed outputs. Really it depends what you're after. Like if you don't really care that much about the quality of the reconstructed outputs and you just really want to explore this uh, latent uh, representation, then maybe you, I need to put, uh, to increase your beta. And when beta is less than one, uh, it uh, uh, places more emphasis on the reconstruction laws. And so it could result in better reconstruction, but it may come at the expense of the not so well-structured Latin representation. So you know, the default is beta is equal to one, but uh, so this is how it actually uh, it is implemented. So this is the training step, okay? Uh, a simple helper function uh, for a training step. Uh, so we, we uh, set the model to training mode, and then we perform a, fo perform a forward pass with the input tensor. X, right? So it's uh, X is a batch of our uh, flattened images. And uh, next we compute the loss, which again is negative log likelihood plus beta times scale divergence. And it's all uh, here. Uh, the only uh, uh, additional uh, operation here is that because we pass a batch in this case of, of 100 samples, then we take a mean uh, over that batch, right? Because the uh, loss should be a scalar. So we we average uh, losses for individual samples uh, within the batch, right? But so you, you can see that beta uh, goes in here, right? So this is the beta coefficient. One of the reasons I'm uh, sort of focusing on this is that there are like several very long I mean beta VI, and it looks very complicated when you read those papers. But in the reality, this is all you have to do to enable beta VI. Right, uh, that that's it. And as you can imagine, you know, beta is an keyword argument that goes into your chain step function. So, uh, you know, you can set it constant for the entire training duration, but you can also pass a different beta, a, a different uh, training epochs, different training steps. So then uh, you can have it dynamically uh, changing as you wish uh, during the training. Maybe you can start with small values and then increase uh, gradually increase it or vice versa, right? But there are like, you know, papers on beta VI and they look a little bit scary and there is way too much math in there, which is not even so relevant uh, to this, um, to how it actually operates. But what I want to point out is that, you know, uh, this, all you need to do is just to add this beta uh, variable uh, to your uh, chain, um, chain step uh, helper function. All right, and so once you uh, get this loss, you perform bug propagation to compute gradients uh, of loss with respect to model parameters. And then you update the model parameters using these uh, computed gradients. And uh, yeah, and then the standard uh, thing you do in Python, you reset uh, gradients to zero for next iteration. And then you just return, well, this step is actually uh, optional but it's a good idea to return loss value as a Python scalar for future visualization. Like you want to make a plot of how your loss uh, behaved during the training. So it's a good idea to, uh, to have it. All right. Now that we defined a single uh, train step, we can finally train our VIE model. So let's train it for a hundred. Let me make sure that I have defined this. Uh, to have better run the cell. Okay. So we, we're going to run, run it for a hundred uh, epochs. And uh, yeah, so basically uh, we, um, uh, at, for each epoch, we iterate over all uh, different batches in our train loader. And uh, so we pass each batch. So X here is a batch of a hundred flattened images. So we pass uh, each, each batch to this uh, train step helper function, which we just uh, studied and it returns. So it does all the necessary steps uh, computes the loss, uh, but propagates it, adjusts the, uh, uh, the uh, model parameters and returns a uh, loss as a Python scalar. And then we just uh, append it. Uh, actually, no, we are, well, yeah, we, uh, we compute it for all batches and then we uh, 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 average our over batches and append it uh, to a list of chain losses. That's uh, all it does. And so, well, sorry, that's, Let's train it.
So it won't take long, uh, but we'll probably need to wait like four or five minutes uh, so that it can complete all uh, uh, 100 epochs, right? But now you actually have a working uh, VI model. We started with uh, defining uh, encoder and decoder neural nets, then we defined VI class that uh, sort of has this entire logic of the variational autoencoder. And then we define a simple um, train step function that computes the loads and also balances the two terms. And then we you know, wrote the simple loop that does the train. So, the, right. So, I mean, if you use Atom AI, uh, it's just, you know, uh, initializing uh, your VI model is just one line of code. And then uh, all this uh, training goes into a single line of code called fit. And uh, it is, uh, I, I mean, the reason I made it such way is so for convenience, obviously. Uh, but sometimes you really need to go deeper. You, you want to tweak a few things. You want to better understand what's going under the hood. And so that's what we are talking about today, uh, how to build it from scratch. And uh, you now this is standard VI. And next we'll talk about conditional VI and rotational invariant VI. And, but it's all built upon these uh, basic ideas that I've just uh, described. So let's, um, let's wait a little bit uh, until it finishes training. Uh, so hopefully you're also running it on um, on your collab instances. I'll just wait until it finishes training. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to um, ask them in the chat or just raise your hand. Yeah, so we are waiting for the training to finish. So again, this is just a sort of poor man version of a, a training loop, but it it um, gets the job done, right? You all basically all you need to know is the uh, where we are uh, in training. So that's why you have the epoch number here. And what is the training loss? Is it decreasing? Is it increasing? Is it staying constant? Uh, so it provides uh, that information. Now, in principle, you can also add the test loss, but here the goal is to learn the um, the latent representation uh, of the entire data set, right? So it's more of, of the dimensionality reduction problem, just some like, a more evolved uh, way of reducing dimensionality of your data. So it's not like you need to test the accuracy of some prediction on the test and validation sets. But you know, in principle, you can uh, here add a second loop where it will um, then loop over the test loader and validation loader, whatever we call it, and compute the loss on, on that test or validation loss. But it's not really that Net important uh, for the dim obviously dimensionality reduction problem as opposed to problems when you do classification or regression analysis. Okay, so it looks like it uh, finished training. And um, um, so we can plot um, 
loss. So you can see it's decreasing. We could have probably continued training a little bit, but uh, it, you know, this is a very nice almost textbook uh, behavior of the loss function. And uh, now that we trained our VIE model, uh, our next task is, well, to do something useful with it, right? So let's, uh, first, let's start by uh, checking how it encodes data into the latent space. So what we are going to do uh, for that uh, is that first we switch the VI to the evaluation mode. So when we were training it, we uh, at each training step, we made sure that it is in the uh, training mode. Now we switch it to the evaluation mode. And uh, it ins this ensures that uh, uh, there are just certain operations that uh, behave differently uh, during uh, inference and training. And uh, so we need to um, sort of account for that. Although for this very uh, simple task, I think it won't really make that difference. No, there should not be any difference at all, but you never know. And it's just safer to always put it in the evaluation mode, right? Uh, because we, we have not used dropout or batch normalization, uh, but just in case it's still safer to put it, to have this, you know, it's a good practice to always put it in the evaluation mode, especially when you use more sophisticated neural nets. Uh, and so we're going, we, we could have used the train loader that we have already initialized because it's a sort of dimension, advanced dimensional reduction task, right? Uh, but the, the thing is that we shuffled uh, all our data when we initialize our train loader and it's good for training so that at each training epoch, uh, the order uh, at which uh, data is being fed to a neural net is not the same, right? Uh, so it helps to do it better, but then it is very hard to compare the shuffle data to the original, um, uh, so to, the, uh, to, to assign labels to that uh, ground data, right? And labels come with the data set. Uh, so that's why, and, and you know, labels are good for visualization. So that's why we uh, created a separate test load and we set a shuffle to false here. And uh, then this is sort of a standard prediction where you uh, you have a context uh, manager uh, called uh, Torch Nograd here uh, that uses Torch Nograd that uh, basically tells PyTorch that we don't need to compute gradients uh, for the upcoming operations. Um, and uh, finally, this is where you do the uh, embedding of your uh, data in, be the, using the trained uh, encoder of the VIE model. You embed data into the latent space. Uh, so what we do here is that to avoid memory overflow, uh, we, uh, we encode um, different batches uh, using a for loop. Uh, and then we concatenate the results together. Now, in principle, you could have passed, I think for, I think for this data set, you could have just, you could have avoided even using test loader and just passed an entire data uh, to the encoder. And I think it could have handled it, but for larger data sets, uh, then your memory will just explode. Uh, so that's why you uh, do it uh, batch by batch, uh, append the results to a list, and then concatenate at least into a torch tensor, right? Just so that, you know, uh, because you know, if there is a memory overflow, then this bad memory will stuck on the GPU. You will have to reset the entire runtime and start it all over. So you don't really want to do it. So it's just much safer uh, to do it this in a batch by batch mode. So let's run. Uh, so what we do here is that we take an encoder of a trained VI model and we uh, use it to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to create a latent, distrib uh, latent space uh, representation of our uh, input data. And then we can, uh, we can plot it. So this is how our latent representation looks like, and you probably saw it uh, many times, uh, uh, but different colors here correspond to different digits. I mean, again, you saw it many times using the, uh, uh, like probably off the shelf codes and maybe some you know, copy pasted uh, poll code but here we created our own BI, we created our own uh, training loop and we trained it uh, and now it is uh, producing uh, good results. Okay, so this is the latent spread representation, right? right? The two-dimensional latent spread representation. But to understand how our VI model captures the 
intrinsic structure of the data, we have to explore its ability to generate new samples as we traverse its latent space. And a common way to do this is generate a grid of points in the latent space and then pass them to the decoder of a trained VI model. And that's what we do here. Uh, so I added some description here of why we use the inverse cumulative distribution function of a standard normal distribution and so on. But the, the, the important point here is that we generate a grid of points in the latent space, okay? And then we uh, uh, see how the um, let uh, how the corresponding structures in the real space uh, look like. Okay, and the same, the idea is exactly the same. We use torch no guard <clears throat> as a context manager and we pass our initialized uh, grid uh, to a decoder model to learn this latent manifold. We do some reshaping to make sure uh, we can generate nice images and then we visualize results. Let me actually run this step. And um, yeah, and so this is how the latent space looks like. You probably again saw it many times, but this uh, time we uh, again uh, implemented everything from scratch and we arrived at the sort of same result that you could get with the off-the-shelf model, but now we have a full control over every uh, single step, over every uh, uh, single function in the uh, VI, right? This is the latent space elaboration of the code. All right. So uh, now we are going to see how we can uh, sort of uh, get to more evolved uh, VI models using this basic um, uh, classes and functions that we have just uh, defined, right? Uh, so I'll give you a few minutes maybe to uh, wrap up this uh, VI part, uh, assuming that you're running it on your instance, collab instances, and then we will uh, move to the conditional uh, VI. Right? And as always, feel free to ask me any question, or if you don't feel like asking question now, uh, asking questions now, you I'm sure you can find my email and just feel free to email me or, you know, ask me on Twitter or LinkedIn or, yeah, that those are the two social media um, uh, tools that I use. So feel free uh, to reach out to me. So I'll wait um, a few minutes and then we will move to the um, conditional variational autoencoder. Okay, uh, so what is conditional variation autoencoder? It is an extension of the traditional VI. And uh, standard VI that we have just uh, uh, constructed and trained, uh, it learns how to encode and decode uh, data in an uh, unsupervised, unsupervised manner. And conditional VI, uh, enables conditioning this process on some additional information, uh, which can come in the form of labels or some other auxiliary attribute. So it could be both discrete and continuous. Uh, I mean, information can come both in the form of discrete vector and continuous vectors. And by conditioning on such auxiliary input, the conditional VI can generate data samples with specific desired properties or characteristics. And this makes it particularly useful for enhancing the interpretability of Latin representations. And specifically in science, right, the, the idea is always to learn, like you don't want your, you know, in general, your machine learning model to rediscover what you already know. Instead, you want to condition it on what you already know to help it discover something new, right? And that's uh, why uh, uh, this uh, tool can be so important, right? So we are going to use just a regular MNIST data. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that someone has ever made any you know, real discovery using conditional VI, uh, but 
I, I think we are getting there. And the, the interpretation of light and space is uh, uh, still an issue in how we uh, make it physically relevant and make sure it respects the physics of our problem. It's still an ongoing uh, process, uh, but we are getting there. And uh, I, I think that this general approach where not just VI, but in machine learning or so-called AI, when we condition uh, something on what, we, when we can condition our machine learning model on what we already know to help it discover uh, something new, uh, I think uh, this is really the, <laughs> the way to go. So anyway, uh, today our focus is on the software and uh, uh, writing machine learning models. So the way we are going to construct our conditional VI is that we are going to uh, subclass the the VI class that we defined in the beginning of this notebook, right? So what it means is that it is going to inherit all the methods of the original class. So because and that's what I mentioned in the beginning. If you recall that once we define the the reparameterization tree, the uh, KL divergence laws, the reconstruction laws computation, uh, it stays there. Uh, it will be, be applicable to a very wide uh, variety of different VI models. So we don't need to redefine them. In fact, the only method that we have to redefine here is this forward path. path. And uh, so now, now the difference is that it accepts two inputs. One again is our image data, but the second input is uh, the condition, right? So it could be a label or it can be some continuous vector containing some uh, auxiliary information about our images. And so this condition is going to be concatenated using this torch cut operation with the input, uh, uh, standard input data and uh, uh, passed to an encoder, right? Uh, then everything is the same. We uh, obtain the uh, mean and log uh, standard deviation, uh, and we use it to sample uh, from a, a normal distribution uh, through the parameterization trick, and then we compute KL divergence. And then uh, now we concatenate this latent vector again with this condition and pass it to the decoder, right? So again, this torch cut operation here, right? So the only difference basically is that we have these two uh, concatenation operations and that now we pass this condition uh, vector uh, to our uh, model in addition to a uh, standard data sample. And that's it, right? Uh, so right, this is again, the beauty of uh, defining everything, uh, all the basics uh, in the uh, this base VI class and then just subclassing from it and making a few small modifications uh, and, you know, I, 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 I guess one thing I really want to emphasize here is that if you look at the CVI papers, it looks so complicated. They, you know, because, you know, sometimes I know that, okay, let, let's not go there why people make their papers very complicated, but they look very complicated. Uh, and, but in the reality, as you can see, it's a very simple operation. Essentially, uh, the only change that you make to your VI is that these two very basic concatenation uh, operations. That's it. And you have your CVI model, right? So don't be afraid when you, you know, paper with lots of math, lots of complicated graphs. Remember that the, you know, the actual implementation uh, and, you know, the, 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 the purpose of this course is not about, not to study fundamentals of machine learning, but how we can adapt them to electron microscopy and perhaps other microscopy uh, experimental techniques, right? So it's actually relatively straightforward, right? And here my goal is to uh, show you how to do it, to know what to change, uh, what to tweak and to empower you with this knowledge. Okay, so we can define our CVI class and uh, I apologize for actually forgetting to write the, <laughs> the description here, but uh, we, so we have our labels that come with our data set and labels like, uh, like one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, so between between zero and 10, uh, uh, we need to convert it to so-called one host representation. And there is a simple uh, uh, helper function that does it. And uh, so this is uh, how they look like. So to uh, to, to clarify what one host representation uh, means, it's easy just to show. 
So basically, if we have uh, a, uh, a digit whose class is zero, so it represents zero, uh, then uh, this one, one quadrupetation looks like this. So everything is zero except for this uh, first entry, right? And uh, if we have uh, a label uh, corresponding to class uh, one to the digit, uh, to the digit which <laughs> represents all ones, uh, it represents one. Uh, then, um, you know, all uh, uh, everything is zero except for this uh, second entry corresponding to one, and so on. Right. So that's what one hot representation is. Okay. And then again, we initialize our uh, data loader, and now in addition to passing data to it, we also pass our labels. Right. And um, Next, we initialize our encoder and our decoder models. And the difference here is that because we do the concatenation in encoder and the decoder, uh, we need to add the number of um, um, of classes in this case, right? So this this ten comes from here uh, to the image dimensions, so that uh, the uh, the ten all the uh, tens of dimensionality are correct. Otherwise, it will be throwing errors. And so it's uh, uh, 784 is the uh, number of features in the flattened images and 10 is the number of classes. So we uh, sum them up and the rest is the same for encoder. And in the decoder, because we concatenate our two dimensional Latin tensor with this conditional vector, which has 10 dimensions. So we also, uh, it's two plus 10 equal to 12. Right. And the rest is the same. We initialize our CY model and we define and optimize. Okay, and now uh, we made a, we make a small changes to our train step function. Again, the only difference here actually is that uh, in addition to passing our images, we also pass a conditional vector here. And uh, so then we you know, pass it to our CY model. So that's the rest is just the rest is the same. Okay, and then we train it. And here again, the only difference is that our train loader now, uh, each batch uh, has uh, image samples. It, so each batch uh, contains a tuple, a tuple and uh, with image samples Im and a conditional vector, right? So let's train it. So yeah, so it will take a, um, maybe five to 10 minutes uh, to complete this training and then we'll view the results. But again, uh, notice that it's it's very easy uh, to go from, from regular VI to conditional VI and conditional VI already allows you conditioning on the available knowledge, uh, hopefully you know, in order to discover something new, right? Um, yeah, and again, uh, you have your loss uh, uh, has two components. One is likelihood or basically negative uh, reconstruction loss. And another one is the KL divergence term. And then you have beta coefficient so you can control it, uh, perhaps to encourage a better uh, disentanglement. So feel free to play with it. Uh, but uh, yeah, just as we discussed, you can uh, you can control beta uh, here. So you can hear already, right? So there is VI, then there is beta VI, then there is conditional VI. Here you already can do better conditional VI, right? So it's very uh, easy. You already have all tools to uh, not just to do uh, better VI and to do just conditional VI. You can actually have a uh, better conditional VI here. That's uh, what it's all about, right? You, you, you can customize it any way you want. All right, so let's wait. Uh, until it finishes training, as always, feel free to ask questions if you have any.
All right, so the training is over. And now <clears throat> what we're going to do is that we're going to visualize a learned latent manifold for each class, right? So instead of just you know, having all of that in this two-dimensional latent space, all classes there and trying to figure out where the transition between different classes happen, we can uh, condition it on each class, right? So let's say we want to see the vari the variations in uh, uh, Latin represent, um, basically the, the, uh, capture the major factors variation in the uh, digit two, right? And so we say, well, okay, our class, class that we're interested in is class two. And uh, so the, the, there are a few uh, additional uh, operations here that you need to do before you can pass it uh, through a train decoder, encoder, uh, right? So you need to convert this integer to a torch tensor, and then you need to convert it to a one hot uh, encoded uh, representation. And then you uh, need to make sure that um, its uh, leading dimensions matches the number of samples in the uh, in generated latent green, and then finally you uh, concatenate them all, to all together and you pass it to the decoder of your trained VIA model. But now the good thing is that it's it's just, you know, you need to define it one time, it's it's always the same, okay? And so let's do it. And now you can uh, plot this uh, latent manifold for this specific class. And so you can see that uh, you can see the different uh, handwriting uh, styles uh, in different parts of this uh, latent space. So if you work with, uh, let's say, defects in electron microscopy, then uh, basically you can imagine that there are some continuous variations in the structure with defects, and then you can, they will be separated in the different parts of the uh, latent space, as long as you know what, uh, what the defect class is. Um, okay, and well, let's do it for other for another class, class number five just to show how it works. And this is five, right? So again, the same idea. So so this is how I uh, see why it works, okay? So basically to conclude with this notebook, uh, we uh, we have, uh, we learn how to uh, define a VI, VI from scratch in PyTorch, how to write a custom training loop, train it, and then how to use the train VI to uh, generate latent representations of data and then uh, visualize learned uh, latent manifolds. And then we extended it uh, to CY uh, where we can uh, condition our uh, uh, VI model on the already existing knowledge to help it learn uh, better latent representations. And by the way, so let, let's compare. This is the latent representation specifically for class five, right? Lots of interesting, you can you know, detect a lot of interesting uh, variations that are in the uh, original training set. Pretty cool, right? But if you look at the original VI, where is number five? I don't even see it here. So it's it's somewhere here, right? So you, know, you don't really see much here, right? Because uh, ma ma major variation obviously comes from the fact that we have different digits. So it doesn't capture these intrinsic variations uh, very well when we don't condition it on what we already know. But once we do this conditioning, it le it uh, learns the intrinsic variations much better, right? So that's, again, that's the idea. Condition it on something that we already know to help it learn uh, something that we uh, don't know and want to uh, discover. All right, so that's it with this notebook. And um, I have another notebook, which is slightly more uh, evolved. And uh, we're not going probably, uh, we won't have time to go through it in uh, great details, but again, I you know I tested it just this morning. It all uh, runs, so feel free to uh, play with it. Uh, but here, the idea is is that sort of we extend this idea of conditioning on the available knowledge to uh, on sort of on on, on labels, uh, and here we essentially, well, not literally, but you can think about it as conditioning it on the fact that our system has rotational invariance, right? So what we do in this notebook is that we create uh, 
a data set of arbitrary rotated images, and then we modify our architecture, the VI architecture in such a way that it can account for the fact that even these uh, images are all, even all the digits are rotated, we sort of introduce our prior knowledge that actually they, those rotations are not physically meaningful, right? And so it should ignore them or separate them into a different latent variable when learning about the structures, right? And so you can, uh, obviously uh, it is important for microscopy observation because just because the same structure is rotated doesn't make it a different structure, it's still the same structure, right? So you need to be able to separate arbitrary rotations from uh, image content. And this is what no, the book does. And again, RVI available from item AI and from PyroVed. Uh, you can use those same limitations, but uh, here I sort of show how to uh, actually implement it and what needs to be uh, done here with architecture. So feel free to check it out and reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, but uh, the, um, yeah, so the RVI uh, is actually very similar to regular VI, but then we, uh, the only uh, change that you make here is that we split latent vector during the forward pass into path associated with rotation and data content and do a few tricks like transform the original pixel coordinates with the encoded uh, angle, latent angle. Uh, variable, then concatenate them together and pass to a decoder, actually somewhat similar to what we did in the CVI. Uh, yeah, and the, the rest is very uh, similar. So I leave it uh, to, as a sort of the home exercise to you. The train step is exactly the same as in the uh, regular VI. And then we run the training and then we uh, find latent representations and uh, uh, visualize the, uh, uh, learn the latent angle associated with this arbitrary rotations. We learn uh, that this angle, the model doesn't know anything about it, uh, so it learns it uh, pretty well. And then we can visualize our learned uh, latent representations. So, uh, yeah. So feel free to, to play with it and uh, let me know if you uh, have any questions. Again, it's all available sort of off the shelf through Atom AI, through Pyreviet. Uh, but if you are, you know, I sort of want want to know all the nuts and bolts, <laughs> uh, uh, so just uh, follow this notebook, which you know has exactly the same logic as the notebook we just uh, uh, talked about in uh, in great details on IVI and CVI. Okay. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I feel like this is all I wanted to talk about uh, for today. Um, Feel free to you know reach out to me. We think you have my contact information. You can just Google me, and uh, if you have any questions uh, specific to the implementation, or maybe if they, you know, there is some specific feature that you wish uh, to see uh, in uh, you know in the different IVI uh, classes available currently uh, uh, through some of our packages on GitHub. Just you know, let me know. Uh, and we can work uh, something out. Uh, yeah. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and also attending this entire uh, summer school. And hope uh, I hope it was meaningful uh, for you. And yeah, and wish you the nice uh, Friday and the nice weekend as well. Thank you so much. Maxim, do you have SSVA from scratch notebook like the similar ones? No. That... <laughs> you, do you need it? I uh, I might like the papers are too hard to understand like what they were trying to say uh, similar to CVA. Yeah. So yeah. Now this is an interesting thing. Uh, for some reason, when I tried implement it in a regular PyTorch, it was not as good as when I did it in Pyro. It's just still a little bit of a mystery to me. Just maybe it's just the way that I constructed that class. I need to revisit it, but no, the short answer is I don't. 
but uh yeah, did. it's been a while to be honest since i worked on um um on vis i think the last time i booked this was like more than two years ago except for just yeah. you know fixing some small bugs so yesterday when i started uh you know, constructing these notebooks it actually took me some time to refresh my memory <laughs> and uh, write them down uh, from scratch. It was quite an interesting exercise. Uh, but yeah, I can add, definitely, uh, I can add service supervised way. I, I agree that the, uh, the, the papers are, are awful. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, I think I stopped. Uh, wait, uh, did I stop recording? No. No, um, no it's just recording.